my name is Martina Diaz. I'm in a financial aid office. Been there for almost 20 years. And so things changed since the last couple of years, especially this last year. Um, you're able to, you know, complete your FAFSA sooner rather than later, October 1st versus January 1st. You get to use your 2015 income versus you wait until your 2016 income information being completed and all of that. So it's a good thing um, to have all of this information to you, available to you. So these are the things that I will be covering today. We got the FSA ID. First of all, who's completed the FAFSA for? Awesome. And you're all seniors, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so there's a few who haven't. Okay. So we'll be going over the FSA ID, the free application for federal student financial aid, which is a FAFSA, data retrieval, which is part of the IRS information, the student aid report, which is something that the student gets back, the cost of studying at UW Madison, what does financial aid consist of, the expected funding contribution, which you're going to hear a lot of, like the EFC, the SAR, FSA, you're going to hear all of that. So just want to put that in there. And how do you need to determine how do you get your financial aid? Awards, scholarships, and other resources. A little bit on budget and safety, financial aid process, and additional information that you may not have known um, pertains to financial aid. So this is how you get your FSA ID. All students who want to sign the FAFSA electronically need to have this, one for yourself and one for the parent. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes each to have your own FSA ID. This is how you're going to um, sign your FAFSA electronically. Make sure you put your um, FSA ID somewhere for the next year because you're going to need that again for next year. So don't lose that. Make sure you put that away somewhere where you can remember it because otherwise it's going to give you um, problems next year when you kind of build this out. If you have another student coming in, they have to have their own FSA IDs, but they can you can use your parent FSA ID for both your and another sibling. Once you completed your FSA ID, you're going to see um, the dark green. It's going to say done. So you got your FSA ID. Now you can go ahead and sign your FAFSA electronically, and also for your parents. So you're going to see another one for your parents, and then you just go back to your FAFSA information, sign it, and you're good to go once you submit it. FAFSA. The FAFSA is a free application for federal student aid. All students who want some type of financial aid, which, whether it be loans, grants, or work study, need to fill out the FAFSA. So even if you wanted a little bit of um, a loan, you do have to complete the FAFSA each year. You obtain your student FSA ID. Make sure you sign your um, application, your FAFSA. The university now has a priority date, which was December 1st. But that doesn't mean if you did not complete your FAFSA, you won't receive financial aid. It's just a priority date that we have set for students. We are trying to get financial aid awards out to students around mid-February to end of February in there somewhere. So you'll have your um, award out there sooner rather than later. We used to wait until beginning of April, um, end of March in there somewhere for students to have a financial aid award. Your FAFSA information will be sent to all the schools that you put on your FAFSA application. So if you have six schools, all that information you put on your FAFSA is going to be sent to that, those, all those six schools. If you want additional um, schools added, then you have to take out um, some of the schools in there and then add other ones. It doesn't mean that the schools that you took out are not gonna, is not going to have that information for you. It's just you're going to add some additional schools up to your FAFSA information so that way they get that. So you will need um, your 2015 tax information for the 17-18 um, academic year. You have to have your social security number information handy. Have your W-2s if you worked. And if you have a permanent resident card, you also have to have that in order to complete the FAFSA. Okay. Any questions yet in regards? Yes. If you have to amend your 2015 tax um, information, um, should, I, should I wait till after? If you have your 2015, that should have been done already last year, right? Yeah, but I just need to amend it. So you do need to amend it. Send in a copy of your tax return transcript that you're going to need, and I will explain that later. Okay. But also have your amended tax information um, form that you will send to the IRS. So we'll need both of those things. Okay. okay. So this is what your FAFSA looks like. If you want to start a new FAFSA, you go on to the start a new FAFSA. You want to log in and continue for next year. You're going to have uh, this continuing, and then you just fill out. It'll do my renewal, 
So you just do that, but that's how it looks. So the IRS debt retrieval. This is something that um, new as of the 2016, 17 year, maybe a little bit a uh, year earlier. And this is where you go onto the FAFSA, you fill out the information, and then it's going to ask you, do you want to use the data retrieval? If you say yes, it takes you to another website where you can actually um, put some information down, and all the tax information will be um, forwarded to your FAFSA. So you don't have to put in uh, any tax information, any exemptions, or anything like that. It's going to be automatically done once you do um, the data retrieval. So there's some scenarios where you cannot do the data retrieval, such as amended tax, or if you owe taxes, um, things like that. So you would, might not be able to do that. Or if your parents file two different taxes, you might not be able to do the data retrieval. So you just got to be, when you're looking at that, on your FAFSA information, you're going to see that it's going to ask you, has your parent or you used any other means of taxes? And then it's going to say, well, you're not eligible to do the data retrieval. This is a little blurry, but this is what it's going to look like um, when you're doing your current tax information. So it can be completed. And then here, it's going to say the data retrieval tool. Go ahead and click on it, and you can go and go into the data retrieval, and then it's going to ask you some additional information. This is what the data retrieval looks like. So once you click, yes, I want to use my data retrieval, it's going to take you to this site. You just fill out this um, information on here, and then that all gets submitted to your FAFSA automatically for you and your parents. Both of you um, can do this. So once you do the data retrieval and everything has been uh, submitted, you get a confirmation page saying this is your FAFSA that's been submitted. You get your DRM number. Make sure you keep a copy of this information because you're going to need, in case you have a lose or you're not able to find your FAFSA information, keep this here so that way the DRM number, the data release number, so that way you can go back and look at all your information. Again, this is where I said if you have a sibling, they also have to do their own FAFSA with their own FSA ID. So once you complete your FAFSA, the student is going to receive a student aid report, the SAR. The SAR is everything that you've supplied on the FAFSA. So it's going to say this is the number, this is your name, this is the security number, your income, number of people in the household, so on and so forth. So you really want to take a look at your student aid report because this lets you know if you made any type of errors, um, say you put $20,000 of your income and you only really made $2,000, you can go ahead and change your information before um, we start reviewing your financial aid file. Okay? So it's really important to read everything on your student aid report. This is only going to come to the student themselves, not to the parent. So make sure you take a look at that. <clears throat> Don't, um, you can make changes by going back to your FAFSA. Now schools are going to require different information from the student and parents. If you are, um, if the federal government says that you have to be verified, that means we're going to have to ask for some tax information, which is a tax return transcript. We may ask for a verification document. Um, we may ask for some additional information from the students, such as W-2s and stuff like that. So make sure you take a look at any emails that you get from our office, okay? So the emails are really important. Don't go and, you know, because sometimes it goes to your spam or your junk mail. Make sure you take a look at that information because otherwise you're gonna wait and see, well, where's my financial aid, where's my financial aid? You know, we send you all this information and you haven't responded to our um, request. So make sure you take a look at all of that because again, we may ask for some additional information and all of that information is gonna hold up your financial aid. Now something new with us again, we are sort of doing this educational partners where they're going to be asking for all of this information from the students. Okay, so if you are selected for verification, you're going to get something from our federal UW Madison staff, education partners, or to be student education partners. Make sure you take a look at that. You can upload all the information, so you don't even have to download the form. You can do everything electronically. You don't have to. Um, have paper, Everybody, everything's going to be done electronically, so you don't even have to, you know, use any paper and, yeah, so you can do that. 
So I'm sure you're here, the cost of attendance for a resident student and a non-resident student, just so you can sort of get a pic big picture as to what the cost is going to be for students who are Wisconsin residents and students who are not Wisconsin residents. So you can take a look at the tuition difference. This is for this current year. And the tuition for a non-resident, of course, is 32000 versus the resident student, Wisconsin students, is 10488 If you're on scholarship, their tuition is going to be covered with 10488 or whatever the tuition is going to be for the 17-18 year. It's going to be covered by your scholarship. Then you're going to have room and board. And this is why it's important to fill out your FAFSA and try to get all the information in and, um, as soon as possible so you can cover the rest of your costs. Room and board is at 10466 or 400, $446. Books and supplies, $1,200. And that's an average. Usually students do not spend that much on books. Usually it's around $300, maybe $400 a semester. Um, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on what your major is going to be. Travel, you're looking at non residents of $1,400 and residents $800. I mean, that's where you can save a little bit of money there. And then we have miscellaneous expenses at $2360. And these are like, <coughs> if you need a new computer, or you need new clothes, or things like that. Yes. And this will be for a student who is taking the like, old courses? Old yes. Courses. This is um, for 12 to 18 credits. So you can take 12 to 18 credits, and your tuition is going to be set at the same price. If you say are at nine credits or eleven credits, your tuition, the only thing that's gonna change is your tuition. Okay? But if you and I don't want to get this too complicated because we'll just leave it at that. So yeah, so ten thousand four hundred and eighty eight is for uh the student who's at twelve to eighteen credits. If you are in the school of business or in the school of engineering, there's additional fees on top of that. Your scholarship should also cover that. Yes. So that's for this current year. Yes. But what's projected for next year? For next year, um, the resident tuition is probably be just slightly more, about maybe uh, total cost uh, about a hundred twenty dollars. I think is what I remember. So it's not too much more. Yeah, because the resident tuition is going to be staying the same. So about maybe like a one percent bump. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the overall cost. <coughs> so financial aid consists of grants, loans, work study, and I put towards the bottom scholarships, because scholarships do not come from our office. You have to apply for your scholarships individually, whether it be from UW Madison, whether it be private scholarships from a bank or Walmart or JC Pennies or anything like that. Make sure you take a look at all of those places for scholarships because they all have some type of scholarships, whether it's for women, women of color, men, men of color, um, <coughs> sciences, math, so on and so forth. They, they're all um, here. And I'll give you some tips. Um, so grants. Grants is free money that you do not have to repay back. So any of you who have received grant money, you don't have to repay that money and you get that on top of your scholarship. So you can use that money for living expenses or food or whatever you need. You also get the Supplemental Education and Opportunity Grant, which is, you're going to see the S-E-O-G, some of you. And then there's institutional state and other grants, such as the Madison, Madison Initiative Grant, the Bucky Grant, the Big Ten Media Grant. There's many grants from our um, financial aid office that you're going to see on a student's award. But again, grants is going to be based on your financial aid need. Then you have loans. Loans are part of the financial aid also. So I know parents and students sometimes say, well, you know, I only got loans and I didn't get any financial aid. Loans are financial aid. If you did not complete the FAFSA, you would not be able to receive any of the federal or state funding um, from the loans. So we have several different loans. <coughs> you have a Perkins loan. That's a 5% interest rate, and it's based on need. You wouldn't be able to receive any of the loan if you did not have some type of financial aid need. That's a nine month grace period, which means you do not have to repay this loan until nine months after you graduate, not while you're in school, so it's after you graduate. Direct loans, we have two different um, types of direct federal loans. We have the subsidized and unsubsidized. The only difference between these two loans, the subsidized and unsubsidized, is that the unsubsidized, the um, loan, the interest starts accruing as soon as it gets dispersed to you. The repayment's the same six months after you graduate, 
the loan interest rate is at 3.76% right now. With the direct loans, though, that does change every year after July 1st. So just be aware of that right now it's lower than it was last year. Um, last year was at four point something, so it did go down this year. So that's a good thing. If you decide to take out loans, if you need the loans, and you've <coughs> been awarded those loans, you need to accept it. You need to do also two other things in order to receive those loans so that way you can receive them. You need to do the loan entrance counseling. The loan entrance counseling is just ask, you know, it's a quick thing on the website. It's asking you some questions. It's letting you know this is a loan. You have to repay it back, blah, blah, blah. This is the interest rate. This is what your payment might be. So you have to do that. Also, to receive some type of loan has to do the loan interest counseling. And then also the promissory note. So if you do have a loan, you do have to complete the promissory note, which is a loan application. So if you have not done those two things, but you have accepted the loans, you're going to be waiting for those loans, that money for you to get until you do those other two things. <coughs> yes? Is this something you could do in the middle of the year if you want to do it? Say you have your loan um, February, right? It, or your financial aid award, and you ex you're thinking about, well, I don't know if I need my loan yet. You can wait a little bit longer. But the thing with these loans, the only loan that might be um, canceled out because you waited too long or it might be um, gone after a certain amount of time is the Perkins loan. So you sort of want to maybe accept it, but you don't have to do promissory notes until maybe the middle of, of the year or maybe the next semester. So you can wait on the loan. A little bit. Yes. Um, can you explain because it's a for me it's confusing mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. direct loan. So it, obviously the idea is if you're applying for a loan you think you need it, but then it says unsubsidized you don't need the loan. Mm -hmm. So I think that what that means is the government saying we don't think you need the loan, but you and your family may right. know that you need that loan. Right. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Cool. Correct. So yeah, the unsubsidized is a no need loan. Any student can receive this loan, whether your parent makes a million dollars or whether they make, you know, ten thousand dollars. So any student can receive that unsubsidized loan. Now, if you receive it in your ward, again, you do not have to take it. You can just say, you know, forget this. I don't need it. I want it. Work study. I know there's a couple of work study students here, um, <coughs> or maybe. Um, but work study, how that works is. Students are able to receive work study on their financial aid packet based on the FAFSA information. So how this works is, say you get a job working with this group, you can, as a college student, what you can do is the, this program will pay half of your wage and work study will pay the other half of your wage. So if you get $10 an hour, $5 is coming from ITT, the other $5 is coming from the federal government. You're still getting your $10 an hour, it's just coming from two different funds. And this stuff lets you sort of figure out, okay, well, I don't want to work here. Maybe I want to do some research. Or maybe I want to work in housing. Or maybe I want to work at the surf doing gym or, you know, something like that. So it just lets you earn a little bit of money so you can use it for whatever you want. It's not money that's going to go towards your um, housing or anything like that. It's going to go straight to your checking or savings account, however you want to um, get that money. And then you can use it for whatever you want and need. Yes? Do you have any advice on how to make sure your work study like applies to your field instead of, well, I worked in a cafeteria washing dishes? There are some. We do have a website on our Student Job Center, and you can start looking for jobs there. But also, if your student has a particular area that they want to major in, they should def definitely go and talk with that advisor, their academic advisor, or whoever they, um, they're working with in that department and say, we well, you know, do you have something here? Maybe I can do some research for you. Because there's some, um, like maybe a year or two ago, there's a couple of um, schools and colleges that use students for research and they can do some research work with them or for them. So just let them know that they can talk with their academic advisor and they might be something available to them. Where the work your connections, <laughs> yes. is what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> yeah, work it hard. Yeah. Yeah. And then we got a job center um, there. And what you want to do is look for jobs there, whether it be, like I said, off campus, off campus. There's some off campus um, work study jobs, such as through the um, Urban League or the schools, if you want to work in the schools, high schools, um, middle schools, anything like that. So 
So expect to find a contribution. You're going to see this a lot. You're going to hear this a lot. EFC, this is what the federal government says um, based on your FAFSA information. Your EFC is this. And so we have to base our financial aid on that expected funding contribution. So how the expected funding contribution is, again, everything that you supplied on FAFSA. So it's really important that you put the correct numbers in there um, so that way you can get as much money as possible and not have made a mistake. Yes? So what exactly is the money contributed to something like that? Yeah. Yeah. When I show show the budget, it will cover any additional financial aid that you get is for your living costs, uh, for your room and board, for books and supplies. So you can use whatever else that you have in financial aid to cover those expenses. You're gonna need it a lot for your housing. So um, yeah, it covers covering your housing. So the expected funding contribution is. Um, it, Calculates all the information, parents, income, assets, students, number of college, um, all of that, and it runs through a federal formula, and that federal formula spits out the expected funding contribution, and all the schools get this number. Now, some schools are a little bit more lenient, okay, yeah, we can, you know, use this information versus that information, and I'll explain a little bit on the special circumstances in a minute. So once everything goes through, we have all your paperwork, well not paperwork, all your information, we have your FAFSA, we have all of this. What will happen next is we start reviewing your FAFSA information and we start making sure that all the information that you have on your FAFSA with the information that you uploaded matches. If it all matches, then we start sending awards to students sometime, like I said, in February, um, end of February, middle of February, in the summer. And then we'll send you an email to let you know, okay, your award is in your email. Um, go in to your student center and look at your information, and then you can accept, decline, whatever, whatever you want. So again, your award can be based on your need. If you don't have any need, then you'll just receive your loan and your scholarship. If you have need, you'll receive the grants, scholarships, loans, and everything else. So again, you don't have to accept everything that's been offered to you. Do those emails also go to the parents or just the students? How much communication needs to happen between the two? Yeah, it's really important for the student to communicate with the parent. We will send one email to the parents saying, okay, we have this information, we may need some additional information. And we will also send out an email communication to the parents saying, okay, your student has received their award, communicate with them as to what that award is. But we will not give you all the information as to what the student is receiving in financial aid. So again, you don't have to accept everything that's been offered. If you just want to take the grants, you can take the grants. You want to take the grants and work so you can do that along with your scholarship. You don't have to take loans. But if you do take the loans, you make sure you do your promissory note and loan entrance counseling. Uh, your financial aid for UW Madison will be dispersed a week before school starts. And um, if anything occurs with you, all you, since you have a scholarship, your financial is going to exceed your um, tuition, so anything that's um, available after that will be sent to you as a refund check. You can get a refund check or send up for e-refund management, and you can that money will get sent directly to your checking or savings account, which is a lot easier and a lot better than having the check sent to you once a week, because our checks get sent out once a week, goes to your mailing address, then you have to send that check to your checking or savings account, so if you sign up for e-refund, a lot quicker and it happens really quick. And there's a lot of information to take in. If you ever have any questions later on, let me know. So this is a cost of attendance for UW Madison, 35,294. And I just took an EFC, uh, the expected family contribution of 2200 So your need is going to be $23,094. This is how much financial aid we can offer you. It's 23094 that's how much financial aid we can offer you um, in federal funds, um, state funds, um, scholarships. So as you can see, you're going to be eligible. If you have the CFC, you're going to be eligible for $36.65 to cover it. You get your scholarship of $10,488. You get an institutional grant of $2,000. A medicine initiative grant of $1,500. You also get work study of $2,500. 
Perkins of $2,600, a subsidized direct loan of $341. And the reason this is $341 is because all of this adds up to this $2,304 or $94. And then this $2,200 right here is this unmet need. So this sort of covers what you and your parents expected uh, by the federal government to cover. So that's the $2,200. And again, you don't have to accept that, but as you can see, yeah, cost yes. Do parents need to sign on the loan with the students? I mean, in this case, the students on the hook for about five thousand dollars. Right. No. Parents. The loans that are offered to these, the Perkins subsidized, non-subsidized. These are all student loans. So parents do not have to sign these at all. Yes. So, is it good to fill out the information for on the desk about your information? Yes, you have to. Um, that's a good question. Okay. Students, if you are not over the age of 24, you are not married, have, don't have your own children, not veteran of the armed forces, um, homeless, and then there's another one, grad student. You have to fill out the FAFSA with your parent information. Okay. No matter if you file your taxes independently of your parents, you still we still need your parent income information. Yes. Does does every student get basically whatever their EFC is offered as an unsubsidized direct loan? Yes, unless their EFC is above and beyond, say, their cost of attendance. Okay. So they're just going to get offered the maximum unsubsidized. Okay. Yeah. So scholarships. Scholarships is a big thing. Although you may have scholarship to cover your tuition, Keep applying for scholarships. Keep applying. Use your essay information from when you did your admissions application. Um, some scholarships will require not only an essay, but also letters of recommendation. Some will require a form. Some will require all three. Some will just require one basic thing, you know, uh, what's your name, you know, what's your uh, major, so on and so forth. So there's scholarships based on academic, academic achievement, academic achievement in need, outstanding accomplishments and majors in academic programs. Here are some scholarships um, that, where you can find in your high schools, local civic organizations, parents' employment. So make sure you check your parents' employment because sometimes their employers have scholarships for their students. Um, church organizations, private organizations. We also have on our website, affinity.org and thefastbook.com. These are very, um, those are national ones. So make sure you, you put your profile out there. So that way you get sent the scholarships that you want and not get bombarded with hundreds of thousands of different scholarships. So make sure you take a look at that. We also have the scholarship books, Parents, College Board, Kiplinger, and Presidential Review. Presidential Review. In here, uh, we have, uh, this is a our website. Um, it's a little bit bigger than I wanted it to be, but scholarships is the first thing on our, our website. Click on there. It'll take you to the different scholarships that are out there for UW Madison, for the different schools, um, and there's also under the scholarships you're going to see other resources. Make sure you click on other resources also because you're going to see um, scholarships for um, the UW Foundation and other types of um, scholarships that are available, such as alumni scholarships too. Save a little bit of money for yourselves. Um, you never know when you're going to need, you know, if you have to go back home, depending on where home is, and maybe you might have to go and visit a sick relative. So save just a little bit of money so that way you have that. It doesn't affect your financial aid, doesn't affect your schoolwork, and so on and so forth. If you do have a credit card, um, make sure you take care of that. Don't overdo the credit card. Um, you haven't seen so many credit card uh, students with a, a large credit card debt. So that's gone down, which is a good thing. Um, so, but if you do have a chance to work the summers or work during the breaks, you save a little bit of money for yourself so that we you know. Yes, sir. In regards to the uh, grades and scholarship information on the previous slide, as a uh, resource on campus, uh, there is the uh, uh, grants uh, information consortium at the Memorial Library, in which they have a number of databases in which you can search online, as well as uh, there are some that you have to go to the library itself that have scholarships available for incoming freshmen that you can search in. Yes. 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 Yeah. Good information. Thank you. Your financial.
financial aid. Whatever you get in financial aid, your tuition is covered for each term. Make sure you budget any financial aid refunds that you get. So if you have, say, $6,000 back in a refund, and you get that, make sure you budget your housing costs, your um, food, and books. Make sure you take the, the four and a half months each term and say, okay, I have $6,000. I can pay all of my housing. If you have enough for housing, pay all of that off right away. Fall term. You got $6,000. Your fall term housing is about $3,700, $4,200, depending on where you live. Take that $6,000. Pay your housing off so that way you don't have to worry about your housing for the fall term. Some students will, you know, only pay one quarter, and then all the other money is gone by the time the second quarter payment is up, and then they're like, what am I, where am I going to get $2,000 after they've used all of their financial aid for the fall term? We cannot get from the spring term and get to the fall term. So it's really important that you take that fall refund money, pay your housing, and then if you have, like, say, $2,000 left over, you're going to need something to eat and buy your books. So take care of that. Okay. Any questions regarding that? We're all going to budget our monies correctly? Yes, ma'am. All right. If for some reason your students are receiving enough financial aid to cover housing, to cover room and board, to cover um, books, anything else that you may need, there is a parent, what we call a direct parent plus loan. That's a federal loan that the parents take out for the student, okay? Now this one will be under the parent's name. If that's not an option, then there's private loans that the student can take out, have the parent as a co-signer. That's another option. We really don't recommend the private loans, but if you are going to need some of these, that's an option for students. Now how these two both work is they're going to do some credits check on, your, on the loans, um, so if your parent takes out a parent plus loan, they're going to do credit check. If you take out a, bless you. Bless you. If you take out a private you. loan, they're going to do credit check on the parent and also the co-signer. We do have information on our website for um, the private loans and the direct parent plus loan. So there's additional information on there, how to apply, what the process is. We also have a uh, fast choice for private loans. That let's just sort of compare the different lenders out there. We have about maybe six different lenders with maybe two to three different um, types of loans. So if you ever find yourself in this situation, we do have information regarding this and how you can sort of choose which lender is best for you. Okay. And then um, it covers anything that you need up to your total cost of attendance. And any time you have any questions regarding this, we can help you out at our office. If you um, go to another school, you can always ask that financial aid office there, but you can always come to us at any time, or call us, email us, however you want to do it. Okay. So the financial aid process. Okay. Again, you can start as soon as October 1st comes around. Have your current income information. Complete the FAFSA or the FAFSA renewal each year. If you have a sibling attending, they also have to do their own FAFSA. Um, you, the student, will receive your student aid report. Complete all institutional forms that we may require or any other institutional um, school may require. And then you will receive a, um, we'll review your financial aid, you will receive a financial aid award via email. Any questions on the process? Not yet? Special circumstances. Say you've been awarded financial aid based on um, that current FAFSA information. If something happens, say your parent loses a job, or um, you know the hours decrease, or divorce, separation, death, sometimes that happens, um, let us know. Don't do anything with the FAFSA. Let us know. Email us, call us, write a letter of appeal or something saying, can you please take a look at this information? My parents are no longer working. They retired. Or something happened and they're no longer, no longer working. We will take a look at that and see if we can offer you any additional financial aid based on the new information we have. But that means we'll probably ask you for some additional information or any other school. Okay. Tax return transcripts. The tax return transcripts, um, we used to have a need a paper copy. Now you can just go again from the tax information, go to the data retrieval, 
submit that electronically, and you should be okay. But if you need a paper copy, you just go to the um, IRS website and request a um, that, uh, tax return transcript. It takes anywhere from seven to about seven business days, um, most in sometimes up to ten days. If you say you do your taxes, well, you don't even have to worry about this for this coming year because you've already done your taxes. Taxes are done for 2015, so all you really have to do is request a tax return transcript via the email or the website. We no longer take 1040s, so please don't submit those. This is what a tax return transcript looks like, so it's different than the tax return forms. Housing, I mentioned housing a little bit ago. Housing, if you're gonna be living in housing here in the dorms, they have more quarter payments. Um, that start in August, October, January, March. And that's why I said, if you have that excess refund money, pay your August and October housing bill. When you get your spring financial aid, your refund, pay your um, January and March housing bill, okay? If you're going to be living in, in an apartment with somebody sharing a room, make sure you can depend on those, on that other student or students that you're going to be living with, because if they're going to be leaving you halfway through the semester or the second semester, how are you going to be taking care of that additional expense? It's going to be up to you and whoever else you may have a room, be a roommate with. So make sure you can depend on those students if you decide to move out of the housing, out of dorms for the next year. Building schedule, again, four payments, private housing. Make sure you take a look at all the, the lease information. I know it's a lot of information to take a look at, especially if you're going to move moving out of, the, out of the dorm. Make sure you take a look at that. Read all the information that's on there. Um, and if you have any questions, let us know. Additional information. This is where some students, well, you know, I didn't know that. But, okay, so the FAFSA needs to be completed each year. If you decide to accept loans, make sure you complete your, what, your promissory notes and loan entrance counseling, those two things. You have to be enrolled in at least six credits to receive financial aid. So if you find yourself, say, second semester comes around and you need to be less than full time, you have to be in at least six credits each term to receive financial aid. If you fall below that, you won't be able to receive financial aid. So keep that in mind. Students, you always must meet the satisfactory academic progress. That means you always have to have a 2.0 GPA, always complete at least two-thirds of all your credits, and you have about maybe five years to complete your undergraduate degree. If you go above and beyond a certain amount of credits, you're gonna to have to um, appeal for satisfactory academic progress. So make sure you um, and that's a 150% rule. Students, if you have any outside scholarship above and beyond your ITT scholarship, then let us know so that way we can make the adjustments before anything gets dispersed to the students. So that way things don't get complicated, you don't have to repay money back. So let us know as soon as possible what type of scholarships you receive, whether it be via email, whether it be via your student center let us know of any additional scholarships that you may have because that does complicate things and sometimes we have to have students pay money back and it just gets ugly real quick. Again, it's almost over. Um, if you have any questions at all, please, um, my email address, I can give you my card also. My email address, my phone number is there, you got my direct number, so my direct number is not on the cards, so if you want my direct number, it's 608-262-4448. And at the last um, bottom part, we have YouTube, which is for uh, the completing your FAFSA. So if you have some troubles completing your FAFSA or doing an FSA ID, that's a pretty good um, site to, to watch. Any additional questions? Yes. Oh, okay. Any additional questions? I have two. Okay. If people are thinking. Um, the first one is about when is the best time to apply. I know you mentioned there's a priority date. Does that affect how much money a student might get? And you know, 
how, how does that whole timeline work, given that you can start applying in October? Okay. okay, so with the priority date, this year we have a priority. That doesn't mean it's a deadline, but the following years we may have deadlines, say in December 1st. The priority that's set for this year is, okay, we want you to have your FAFSA done by um, December 1st. If next year we change that to a deadline, that may cut you from receiving some good um, grant money or um, Perkins money or something like that. So make sure you fill out your FAFSA within the October 1st to December 1st um, timeline. Because it may affect you for the next year. Not this year, because things have changed so much that we're just putting a priority dead deadline, not an uh, actual deadline. And then my second question is, um, the nitty gritty of using two a, a tax return that's two years old, mm -hmm. and if your financial situa situation has changed, should you just wait until you file the current year's taxes, the, the one year ago taxes, or should you apply with the two year old one and then submit whatever okay. how your financial situation Good question. has changed? For this year, you have to use your 2015 income. If something changes for 2016, say your uh, parents' income um, decreases, what you want to do is um, write a letter of appeal saying, can you please reevaluate my financial aid? My parents' income is less than the 2016 year versus the 2015. And then we'll ask you for some additional information at that time. But definitely you have to use the 2015 income. That is federal regulation. Okay. 